It is my pleasure to welcome back to the Hartwell Studio Work Sports Branding Podcast, Dan Tudor. Uh, Dan is the president of Tudor Recruiting Strategies and has been with us here previously. Dan, thanks so much for being here. Hey, thanks, John. Good, good to be here. So, Dan, in your work as a college recruiting coach, you are always emphasizing the best ways to get recruits' attention. Anybody who follows your Twitter feed, follows you on social media, know that uh, that you have uh, multiple strategies to get in front of uh, upcoming college students. How, how do you get them to notice you? How do you get them to pay attention? How do you get them to listen to you on the way to making a decision about what college to attend? And one of the recurring themes in your advice is for coaches to tell recruits a compelling story, one that grabs the attention of the recruit and gets them engaged. And I really enjoyed the way you took that idea to the next level, if you will, in an article that you wrote uh, on Nebraska's Tourism Board's new marketing strategy uh, about, about owning who you are and telling recruits who you're not. And I'll have a link to that story in, in the show notes for this episode. Now, obviously, Dan, I'm not in the recruiting game, but much of what how you're framing recruiting strategy, I think, overlaps with good branding strategy. And so I wanted to take a little bit of time to unpack your ideas about good storytelling and how it's good for business. So let's start with that. Tell me a bit about what you mean when you talk about telling a good story. Well, I mean, I think first to start off with a disagreement with you, John, you okay. are in the recruiting business. Um, you're recruiting listeners to the podcast. Uh, as a business, we all try to attract new customers. If you're a politician, you're trying to recruit new votes. So recruiting, what we talk about, of course, in, in this context is with athletics, getting a, a high school student athlete to say yes and come and compete for you at your college. But the idea of storytelling as a way to do that, as a marketing or branding technique, um, happens all over the world, certainly all over our country, 24-7 in pretty much every aspect of our life that, that, we, that we experience. Um, the, the thing that I often compare it to is politics, that you know anybody listening to this in the last election voted for one person and not the other person. And we came to understand or believe who we should vote for based on either a lifetime of, of experience or a story we have told ourselves about what we want the world to look like. Um, and the other side maybe has a completely opposite view, whatever that other side is. And what's interesting is that you can't, in politics usually, get the other side to switch their ideas because that would involve telling ourselves that the story was wrong and I have to unbelieve now everything that I believe in is hard, which tells you the power of a story is that once it cements itself in, that tends to be what a uh, what a recruit or a voter or a customer ends up uh, ends up uh, moving forward with as, as a way uh, to, to make decisions. So when we look at this idea of storytelling, I know a lot of coaches haven't thought about this before in recruiting. They think recruiting, a lot of them think it's just, I need to list out the things that we have at our school and get them here and show them some you know, raw, raw enthusiasm. And that's what gets them to commit. And once in a while, that might work. But more often than not, especially with this generation, which has changed their buying habits completely compared to last generations, uh, they're making an emotional decision, something where they're trying to connect with and find value in what they're, what they're saying yes to, uh, whether that's a school, a program, or a coach. And that involves them either telling themselves a story and making up a story about you, either positively or negatively to make a decision, or, and this is the way that we vote, for coaches, the coach and the program tells an outbound story, very passionate, consistent story that helps fill in the blanks and helps that student athlete say, oh, okay, that's where I should go. That's what I, I, I knew I wanted something. That sounds like it is, that's what it is. So I'll follow that. And that's really at the base, what we talk about when it, we're talking about storytelling. So looking at your article on Nebraska, the thing that really resonated with me was you you really emphasize the idea of telling us embracing who you are telling a story about who you're not and purposefully and intentionally differentiating yourself from your competitors tell me a little bit about uh, about why that caught your eye and why that's so important 
Well, so and you're going to have a link to this, so people who aren't familiar with the article or the the basis for that article, uh, they can read it. Or but let me just summarize really quickly that Nebraska years ago came up with an ad campaign that at the core really was, and this is one of their taglines, is that honestly, we're not for everyone. And, you know, how refreshing is that for somebody to say, look, we're not going to pretend that we're, you know, the beaches of California or the big city of New York or whatever other vacation spot you might be looking for. We're Nebraska. We're in the middle. Um, a lot of it's flat. And they sort of own that. And in the, in the branding and the marketing, because they were honest, because they were poking fun at themselves a little bit, it made them more human, if a state could be human, mm-hmm. and you know, got attention and gave people another reason to say, oh, okay, well, what is Nebraska all about? Whereas before, if Nebraska had said Nebraska, more fun than New York City, <laughs> you know, we're going to say, no, you aren't. I already know. I think I know what Nebraska is all about. You're not more fun than New York City. Well, by taking the opposite approach, by telling a story that was um, both transparent honest, something that probably connected at some level with what we all believe about Nebraska, which is you know, it's in the middle. And I don't think of that as a, as a vacation spot right away. But because they approached it the way they did, they could outline, no, wait, here's where you're wrong. And we have this and this. And look, there's this over here. And here's what people like doing. And it kind of makes us look at the state in a new way. So translating that to coaches, the, the coaches that aren't afraid, first and foremost in storytelling, if they're not afraid to reveal who they are, if they're not afraid to be honest and vulnerable and admit they're not perfect, which we all know, no coach, no program, no school is perfect. Then it gets our attention and tells and says to us, okay, if you're being honest with me about that, you're probably going to be honest about the other stuff. And I don't have to have my defenses up. I can actually just sit back and take in the story and you're going to let me make a decision on my own compared to, and we've all seen movies like this where we go into a movie and they're trying so hard to make the character lovable or we want to side with it, but it just doesn't work. They're, they're not, they're not making him vulnerable. It's almost too perfect. And um, that, that ends up not, not being transparent. And we see that again, I brought up the, the example of politics. So many examples in the past 20 years of politicians at all levels who have tried to create themselves and be perfect. And of course, there's never perfection and they, you, we find uh, little dents and scratches and that's what ends the campaign. Whereas somebody who might be um, less than perfect, but you feel like, okay, well, at least I know they're telling the truth and honest, then that's going to be um, maybe somebody who we are gravitating to. And that, that crosses all party lines, all levels, all states. Uh, that's an example of what coaches can do. And too many coaches, John, are focused so much on hiding the bad locker room or the fact that they're in a credit conference or there's only a subway and a gas station near campus and there's not the you know movie theater in the big mall and I got to hide that. No, you don't hide it. You explain to me why I, have the, as a recruit, should want that. Because on the surface, I might not think I want that. Tell me why I should. Make the case. And that, that again, is gets back to the core part of storytelling and recruiting. And it's very much about, about not intentionally and purposefully not trying to be like everyone else. I think one of the things that, that in that recruiting process, the sales process, the branding process, folks want to look like to a certain extent, they belong in a group. And so that means that they, that they tend to, to echo or look like everybody else. And of course, what happens is then you don't stand out at all. And it's that in embracing the differences that I think really elevates a person in or an organization to really stand out. Uh, absolutely true. And, and the perfect example of that is actually on the other side of campus over in admissions. Um, look, we love admissions departments. We work with admissions departments. The problem with college admissions and the story that colleges generally tell is that colleges want to attract what they think is the most amount of people to come in and apply. And that means we need to have a little something for everybody in the process of trying to to offer a little bit of something or be something to everyone. You actually lose any kind of identity or opportunity to build an identity. And the result is you have college students and college athletes looking around at different colleges and saying, well, that one's just like that one, which is just like that one and that one and that one. They're all the same. They're all the same. They, they look the same. They feel the same. They're saying the same things. They're sending me the same things. Their letters and emails look the same. And so 
I then, as the, the prospect or the family that's making that decision on where to go to college, I have to then invent my own reasons for what that, that buying decision should be. And as I, we, we talk about in the workshops that we do on campuses, why this is so important for coaches to take the lead on having this conversation and defining themselves as something different. If you leave me as a dad of three, one out of college, one about to get out of college, and then a 15-year-old, which, you know, we're coming up on another college experience. If you give me as a dad, whether it's what shoes to buy or what college to go to or a hotel to stay out on vacation, if you give me five identical things to choose from, what is my go-to way of making a decision? If I think they're all the same, it's going to be based on price. Uh, if everything's the same, I don't want to pay more for something that's the same. I'll pay less. Mm -hmm. That's that's dad. Book. And so that's happened unbeknownst to many admissions departments. That's the way people are looking at the college decision process is all the schools look the same. They all have the business degree. They all have about the same stuff on campus and there's not really a differentiator. Um, so which one's less? And that's why admissions departments, college coaches get into these price wars over Hey, that one's $2,000 cheaper. Can't you get down to $2,000 the same as they are? And it goes into used car buying. We're looking at the best deal and we didn't wind up with a school that maybe wasn't the best fit. I don't blame the consumer. I don't blame the prospect, the family for this. I blame coaches and admissions departments. The ones that have the product and the service. They're the ones that are seeing it to the public you have to do a better job of connecting and this older style of just listing out what you have and explaining, Hey, we're a college. So of course you should want to be here. That doesn't work anymore. It's it's we're further down that line of, of how we think about colleges in the U S to think that just because you have a campus, people are going to come to it. And what many admissions departments and coaches unfortunately are finding is that they won't just come. You have to give them a reason to be there. And, just to finish the thought, uh, how important storytelling is going to be in the future, um, people that will be watching this on YouTube, on your channel, 10, 15, 20 years from now, could look back uh, here in 2021, as you and I are talking, uh, when I say that there's going to be a time in the near future where colleges and coaches are going to have to convince students and student athletes why it's smart to go to college why they need a college education, because truthfully, John, there's a lot of industries now and an increasing number every year. You don't need a college degree to be successful. Um, and you're going to start seeing companies offer, uh, offer training programs where you just go right into the job out of their training program out of high school. So there's really this inflection point within the, the college experience and, and, uh, and how we define that now. We're going to have to tell a story around that for the next generation of kids that are going to be going to college or maybe not going to college. So let's let's stay with that idea of, of the admissions offices here for, for just a moment and, and the idea that so many colleges from an institutional standpoint all look the same and, can, and just cannot uh, articulate differences, real value-driven differences. That, of course, then translates into athletic programs and then, of course, down to coaches. So what would be your thoughts, your advice for right now for a college uh, to... How can they think about, how can we differentiate ourselves? What are the kinds of things that these schools should be looking at to create those stories that separate them from everyone else? Well, great question. So let's start with what we kind of first started talking about, which is the Nebraska example. What, who isn't your college right for? And that's, that's a question that, that if you just started there in terms of sort of breaking out or breaking into maybe a more creative way of thinking, uh, name me three things about your school that wouldn't be good if I was this person. So whether that is um, you're just the, the type of student that does well or doesn't do well there, I need a definition of that. Um, if you maybe if we're a rural, a rural college and we're in the middle of a city, uh, you're coming from a city, you know, you have to want the, the rural setting. So tell me some things where it might be um, not a good fit, which then also allow me to say, no, no, I want that and that and that. So good. Okay. So you might be a school based on your story, your definition that I would want to go to. Okay. Now I can take that next step. So I think it becomes, you know, number one, being creative in the way that you define yourself. And along with that, 
comfortable with not being perfect, comfortable that there are, that there are students and apps out there that aren't going to be the right fit um, and, and explain who those, uh, who, who those are. Um, I also think that within college uh, circles in general, John, um, it's all the same people that every couple of years switch campuses. So in, in terms of marketing and branding and, and even storytelling on a campus, there's not a lot of fresh ideas. It's, you know, I'm trying this at this school because I did it the way at my last school and it's now it's not working. So I'm gonna hurry and go to another school before I get in trouble with this one, but I'm gonna bring the same ideas. And that kind of musical chairs has happened now for a decade or two. And it's interesting when people do come in to somehow they, they wind up inside of a college setting from the outside world where they come in for marketing or business or sales or some other industry. And now they're on a college campus. And I talked to some of these people. They say, it's so strange here. Nobody does the same things that we did out in the, in the private sector in the business world there. They don't change. And, um, that's a problem because the generation has changed and dra changes drastically every 10, 15 years. And certainly um, the kids that you're recruiting now, if you're taking the same approach that worked 20 years ago or 25 years ago and using it with this generation, which you know, the language, the story, um, what you're emphasizing, what you're not emphasizing, you're having trouble. And, and a lot of colleges, unfortunately, are having trouble with that because they're not they're not taking in these new ideas and understanding exactly how buying decisions are made now with families um, and, and with students. So I, I, would say I identify those as the core issues or the core problems um, and just you know, this general attitude like, well, this is the way that we do it. So we're going to keep doing it, even though it doesn't work. So last question here, in, in talking about creating those points of differentiation, selling to a particular audience, can you talk a little bit about how important it is to create those emotional connections to make someone really get emotionally invested and emotionally engaged? It's not just about your pretty pictures and your little Hogwarts school. It's finding something that can that can emotionally pull the person into and want to be on your campus. Yeah, yeah, very, very well said. Um, so I mentioned money was one of the, the decision-making factors. If you if everything is the same uh, from an academic standpoint and or from a you know, presentation standpoint, one of the main factors I'm going to use is cost because I don't want to spend too much on the same thing. The other thing, the more common tiebreaker along with cost is the emotion. And if you look at or ask students, if you're somebody in the, in the college setting that, uh, that you know, is listening to this, you could ask one of your students or one of your athletes, hey, why did you pick our school? And I'm going to bet 99 times out of 100, in their explanation, the word felt is going to come out. So, you know, what it is, mm -hmm. is that I felt this way when I saw that, or when this person talked to me, I just felt like this was going to be a place, or the, the team made me really feel welcome here more than any other team, and so this is where I wanted to go. So they're making emotional decisions based on feelings. Um, that... That needs to be emphasized. And again, here's the struggle. I say that and it sounds easy. Just, you know, make it a more emotional experience. The smart adults on a college campus, let's just, you know, throw the two of us into that um, a little <laughs> bit. We'll, we'll, we'll identify with, uh, with smart adults you know, on a campus. We think we know how to do it. And we have all this information that we just have to get to these athletes and these students in order to, to, for them to see how great our campus is. And it's actually, it's the converse. It's the less you talk about the information, the details, especially when they're on campus, and you give them more time to just feel it out and be a student, um, walk around with other students or other athletes the majority of the time. That's what ends up selling them and, and connecting them with that school. So that part conceptually is very easy. The hard part, John, is convincing some coaches and most admissions departments to give up control of, you know, of, of the process. So when I come on the campus as a family, uh, where you got this meeting, this meeting, that meeting, and we want to show you this. Now we're going to walk around for an hour. Even though you don't want to, we're going to walk around for an hour. Then you're going to meet with this person, this person. And what's interesting is what a lot of students and athletes tell us afterwards as we're doing our focus group testing and research with them, a, a, a majority will bring up at some point, you know what, I met this person, this person, this person. I haven't seen them since I got 
here to campus? Uh, why did I have to spend time with them? Why did I meet them? What our research shows is that about 80% of the decision has been made before they come to campus. So in other words, I'm not going to come visit your campus unless I already know about the dorms and, and the, um, the, the academic offerings and the pros and the cons. I'm going to study up because we all have smartphones. We all have access to the internet. And again, it's not like 20 years ago where we, um, where we needed to come to visit campus to see what campus had. Uh, now we don't. So what are the blanks I'm trying to fill in when I do get to campus? It's how do I feel? Does this person seem to want me? How are they different than the other schools? And that's not what gets emphasized. What's, what's, what gets emphasized is the traditional visit that's been the same for the last 30 years. We're going to show you this, this, here's what we have, here's what we have, here's what we have, here's what we have, here's what we have. And that's why I, I joke sometimes at the end of admissions visits or the tours that go on on campus, watch them walk back to the admissions office. Um, what's their body language like? Do they look excited? No, it's a grueling, boring grind that if I've done it four or five times, this is sounding like just the others. And so, again, I go back to inventing my own ways of making decisions. So a big part of this story idea that we're trying to, to get colleges to adopt is you're not in control of the story, but your students, your athletes are the experiences, the feel of campus is adults. Let's all get out of the way and just let them walk around campus. So my point is this. If it doesn't change, there's going to be the same struggles with admissions departments that there have been over the last few years. And that's going to, not going to bode well going into the future because there are fewer students to, uh, to, um, to recruit and to, to come to campuses. Uh, there are, there's a lot of campuses in financial trouble because, again, kids are having other options besides going to college as a way forward to success. So a college campus, a college admissions department, a coaching staff has to look at their local level, just the, the recruits that they influence, and say, how do we change, tell a better story that, that sounds more genuine, that explains more about why they should want to be here, uh, and less of the traditional visit roulette wheel that, that just keeps spinning and, and that we've been using for the last 20 years. I've heard it described. You, you, you mentioned there are going to be less students. There's a, there's a demographic cliff coming up uh, for, uh, for higher education. And if anything, the immediate urgency of that cliff uh, requires some real sharpening of the points of, of recruiting stories, of admission stories, uh, and really making sure that you're, that you're not coming across as bland vanilla, but you're actually describing those differences so that, so that, student, so that students and their parents can make, I want to say, informed choices, but uh, confident choices about where yeah. they want to go. Right. So the, the next cliff, as we sit here in 2021, is in 2025. There is, that's the, the group of 17, 18 year olds that um, were born uh, in during the, the height of the Great Recession, 2008. And so uh, there, there, are, there are less kids uh, in that age group. There are less kids graduating in those two years than ever before. And so there's going to be a strain on incoming freshmen. And, and you know, that many colleges are on such a, fi a tight financial leash that uh, that's going to be pro that's going to be a trouble for them if they don't change the way that they're doing things. So number one, there's a there's a very very real monetary reason to to look at some of the things that, that you and I have been just talking about. Uh, the other thing is that uh, in terms of what to answer for that for that generation or for that those incoming prospects now and into the future. When we ask athletes to identify the things that they really look for during the recruiting process, and this applies to students as well, they're trying to, it comes down to two key questions. Number one, they are asking and asking a coach or an admissions department to prove to them, why should I choose you? Simple, not what do you have at the campus, but why should I choose you? Mm -hmm. Which is mm -hmm. going to mean they're going to have to, as colleges are going to have to insert some opinions and some, some reasons that, that they're going to make the case, here's why. And number, question number two, why are you better than my other choices? So it's not just that you have this and this and this. I understand that, but how is that better than all these other options? Because again, I'm in comparison mode and I want the best, maybe the least expensive, or I might be willing to pay a little bit more if you prove to me that I should pay a little bit more and explain to me why. Make the case. 
we all need that in, in our normal everyday life when we're looking at buying something. We're sort of looking for that salesperson. We're looking for the expert to explain, here's why you should want this, this bigger TV. Yeah, it's $800 more. But when you set it up, your home theater, it's going to look like this. And here's the big difference. Make the case as to why I should spend the more money or why I should go to the rural campus or why I should go to the big city campus when I'm coming in from a rural setting. Um, why I should join your team that finished second to last in conference. I need the reasons and what we find right now, um, and it's changing. Many are, have changed and found success with uh, these principles that we're, that we're outlining, but most schools are still doing the same things they did in 1991, 1992, thinking it's going to work. And it's, it's a problem that, that really needs to get fixed. Yeah. And so all of what you've described, this, this conversation is about laying the foundation for that story, that, that admission story, that recruiting story, and ultimately that branding story, because it's from that foundation then that everything else gets built. And, and let me just maybe finish with, with a couple of quick thoughts just on mm-hmm. the sort of complete the story loop. Sure. Um, it involves consistency over a long period of time. So we don't oh, yeah. expect a prospect to make their decision and to be convinced of us within the first week or two. We would love that in, in the college world, but that's not realistic. So we need to be patient. We need to understand and we need to start early. And it might take 12, 14 months for them to finally say, okay, now I get it. So prove that you're, but that you're uh, worthwhile through the length of the recruiting. Um, make sure it's through a variety of different mediums. Make sure that when you're talking to them through those mediums, I'm talking about you know text messaging, social media, emails, letters, I, use the language that you use in everyday in, in your everyday world. Don't come up with the big words, the, the eloquently stated long paragraph sentences uh, or paragraphs. Um, talk conversationally, talk in a way that I would hear another human being talk to me. Because the other thing about this generation that's interesting, that really wasn't a present uh, um, hurdle for past generations, was. I've learned to communicate in a written way or read communication through text messaging. I've grown up with it if I'm in this generation. And I, those are my friends texting me. And so it's very conversational back and forth. And I use language, but I use it in a way that's, that is, you know, it's conversational. The big gap that's, that's being created right now is when colleges use this very formal talk track. Um, and it doesn't match what I, as the, the 17 year old, have grown up with, it doesn't seem real. It seems fake, even though the college is making a genuine attempt at communicating, they're actually hurting themselves by being um, so well-educated and using their masters and doctorates to write out these messages when the kids just want you to talk to them in a way that is very direct, very simple, so that I don't have to pick through everything to figure out what you're all about. And that is another element of, of how effective storytelling is done when we're talking about recruiting. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Well, Dan, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for, for, for dialing in uh, from the road and, and for sharing such outstanding uh, thoughts and contents. Uh, I hope that, uh, that, that everyone who hears this conversation picks up a few ideas and can, and can improve their recruiting and of course their branding game as well. Thanks so much, Dan. We appreciate you being with us. Thank you, John. Thanks you. Thank you for what you do as well. My thanks again to Dan for his time and willingness to share some outstanding information for you and your branding efforts. You can get in touch with Dan using the information listed in the video description below or in the podcast show notes. If you're watching on YouTube, please like and subscribe. If you're listening on a podcasting platform, please subscribe, leave a five-star review, and hey, write a review. Help other sports professionals find this podcast. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. (laughs) 